This is CBC Here and Now. A man entered the, entered the bank, uh, presented a firearm, demanding cash. Daytime armed robbery. A man holds up a bank at the Avalon Mall. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. Police are on the hunt for a man who brought a gun into the Avalon Mall this morning. He robbed a bank inside the mall and then escaped in broad daylight. It happened at 10.45 a.m. The man walked into the busy mall, then into the CIBC, where he showed the teller a gun and demanded cash. When police arrived on the scene, the man was already gone. He was able to flee the scene on foot with an undisclosed amount of cash. At this time, the investigation is ongoing, and uh, you know we were able to obtain an image of this suspect. Uh, he is a, a man uh, who wore an orange cap, orange pants, a brown green uh, sweater, and uh, appeared to have glasses on and carried a backpack. Now, at this time, uh, we do believe that this man may have a firearm, so we asked the public to uh, contact the RNC if he is spotted. And uh, can you tell us about the impact the incident had on the staff uh, inside the CIBC bank? Well, as you can imagine, it's certainly uh, quite an alarming uh, offense. And, uh, you know, we're speaking to staff and uh, giving them the support they need and ensuring that uh, if they have any issues that they can come forward to us and uh, we can discuss any concerns they may have. Now, the incident caused a temporary closure of the CIBC, but elsewhere in the Avalon Mall, it was business as usual. Well, Newfoundland and Labrador relies on offshore oil revenues. Lots of people work on the rigs. The economic benefits of the industry in this province are undeniable. But those benefits come with consequences. On Saturday, there was another oil spill off the coast, the third in less than a year. Here announced Katie Breen will talk about the environmental impacts. But first, Katie, what is the latest on the spill? While cleanup vessels are going to start heading in, Hibernia reports that the oil sheen has dissipated, that it's dispersed. The rig remains shut down. Production stopped on Hibernia after the spill, and it won't start back up again until CNLOPB gives the go-ahead. In the meantime, the investigation continues. We know a valve supplying gas to the platform's generator somehow closed, causing a power outage, and that's when the estimated 2200 liter spill happened. There have been no reports so far of any oiled birds, but wildlife observation and water sampling is going to continue. Well, Katie, we often talk about the environmental damage when a spill happens, but there are other environmental concerns like the greenhouse gases released from oil production. So aren't governments supposed to be cutting back on those emissions? Yes, they are. But... The province's plan is actually to double oil production by 2020, and that, of course, comes with its own emissions. The province says it's working to reduce carbon in other ways, like changing out diesel systems and converting government buildings and vehicles from gas to electric. But critics say something should be done about the offshore. I spoke to Decarbonize NL co-chair Nick Mercer today. He says we need to weigh economic benefit with economic fallout, like the global climate and spills like the one on Saturday. He's not anti-oil. He doesn't think the offshore should outright stop today, but he says production shouldn't grow and that the province could be more responsible with its targets to try and keep global warming down. For instance, if we were to set a goal of diminishing, of scaling back offshore oil 37% by 2030, if we were to set a goal of being totally off of oil by 2055, these, this would be a way that we could continue to leverage those oil royalties while also making decisions that are compatible with climate science. Is a big proponent of wind energy, says there's a lot of potential for it here, and that wind energy poses no risk for another oil spill. Now, the province says it's working on a renewable energy strategy that may include wind. Live in the newsroom, I'm Katie Breen for Here and Now. some showers moved through earlier today still seeing some showers in areas but uh, the clouds are starting to clear and will continue to do so as we head through the night tonight those temperatures a little bit cooler as anticipated yesterday 21 degrees was the afternoon high in St. John's uh, still reaching the mid to high teens though through central and then again along the coast of Labrador still hanging on to those single digit highs now uh, we are in for a cool down as we head towards the weekend this is a look at the upper levels a little 
little bit of a cold pool sets up by the time Friday and Saturday rolls around as it moves across Newfoundland. Don't worry, it doesn't last long. We're going to see some heat before we get to that point, but I'll have all those details coming up. Staff uh, have given us the estimate around $50,000 a day. There's a steady stream of pumper trucks in paradise, but the town's sewage problems carry a hefty price tag. Ryan Cook has the details ahead on Here and Now. Well, there's a call tonight for the Auditor General to investigate a controversial decision by the province. PC leader Chess Crosby wants the Auditor General to take a close look at why wetlands weren't capped before the Muskrat Falls Reservoir was flooded. Indigenous groups wanted the vegetation covered up. They argued leaving it to rot underwater would result in a higher amount of methyl mercury being released into the environment. And they say that could make fish, seals and seals seabirds in the area unsafe for human consumption. Now, Nalcor disputes that. However, government did promise to cap the wetlands and set aside $30 million to pay for it. But the deadline to do the work was missed. So the money is being offered to Indigenous groups in Labrador. Crosby says the Auditor General needs to look into how that failure to cap the wetlands occurred. Rob, was there, was there bad faith involved in this? Or was it simply incompetence? We will never know the answer to this unless we use a mechanism like the Auditor General to get the facts of the matter, to start the process of healing with Indigenous people and to fill in the gap that the Commissioner has in the evidence. And that gap is Minister Parsons. What we have here is a situation whereby Mr. Parsons has been dodging the press all summer. He's now taken the position that as Former minister, he can't speak about his activities in the portfolio. He's pointed us to Ms. Dempster, the present minister. She takes the position she can't comment on the activities of former ministers, and she's not going to investigate either. And the lawyers for Mr. Ball have told the inquiry that it's not his job to investigate. So unless this happens, we won't know. Now, to get the Auditor General involved, there would have to be a request from the Liberal Majority Public Accounts Committee. That committee is chaired by Tory MHA Kevin Parsons, who tells here and now he will take the request to his fellow committee members, and they meet again in early September. Well, Beatrice Hunter is no longer vying for Yvonne Jones' seat as a member of Parliament for Labrador. Two weeks ago, Hunter said she would be seeking the NDP nomination for the riding. Well, today she took to Twitter to say she's unable to run due to personal reasons. The Inuk mother and grandmother was jailed for 10 days for refusing to promise to stay away from Muskrat Falls construction site. Today, Hunter declined CBC's request for an interview. Larry Fleming, an engineer, from Churchill Falls is running for the Conservatives. Well, if you live in paradise, it's possible the constant droning of sewage trucks has been keeping you awake for the last week. Unfortunately, there is no good news here for you. Here now as Ryan Cook dove into the sewage issue today to get answers on what's going on, how long it will take, and what it will cost to fix a sewage lift that just won't lift anymore. Paradise has a problem. It's undesirable, it stinks, and it's expensive. Staff uh, have given us the estimate around $50,000 a day. Over the last eight days, that's $400,000. It's a steady operation here in Paradise with trucks coming and going, pumping the waste and relocating it elsewhere. And they've been doing it all day, every day since last week. This lift station broke down last Monday. It's supposed to take sewage from the bottom of St. Thomas Line and force it up to the top. Now these trucks, eight of them in total, have to pump the sewage out and drive it down the road. They take about 15 minutes to fill up and leave. Then another one moves in, hooks up and begins pumping. Mayor Bobbitt says it's a major emergency expense, but residents won't see any effects in their bathrooms. We don't know what caused it right now. We are investigating. Our biggest thing now is to contain the issue. Uh, residents still can have essential services. They can still use their washrooms. Bobbitt says the town will be going to the Department of Municipal Affairs and Environment for financial help. Despite the steady cycle of trucks, they can't pump fast enough or clear enough sewage to get to the root of the problem. 
The town believes it's an issue with the pumps in the ground and the pipes below them. There's no timeline for when the sewage will flow uphill again. Ryan Cook, CBC News, Paradise. Well, there's light at the end of a tunnel for a woman trying to find out what's medically wrong with her. Suzanne Whalen has a mystery illness and has been in pain for 16 months. No one here can diagnose it, so her doctor recommended she travel to Toronto to see one of the best specialists in the country. But the medevac couldn't take her unless she was already admitted as a patient at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. Now, the problem was the doctor here didn't have the authority authority to admit her. Well, since we brought you the story, doctors have arranged for her to be admitted to the Toronto hospital. She now has appointments booked for the end of the month. Well, for some people, buying and maintaining a bike is an unrealistic expense, but now a St. John's Community Centre has a plan to help vulnerable, vulnerable people get around town. Cease Hare has more. The brake don't work. It goes right to the handlebar and she don't stop. You have to have brakes, and Bruce Hodder's brakes are getting fixed for free, parts and labor, at the gathering place where he's a client. Hodder says he needs his bike to get to his part-time job, and this repair program means he doesn't have to worry about the cost. If I went to the bike shop now and get that done, now it's probably going to cost me 40 bucks just for the mechanic to look at it, probably another 20, 30 bucks for him to fix it, and then I might have to wait three or four days my bike could be in the shop and I don't have it. Come down here, when he gets it done, I can ride my bike home, and that's it. When the program started a year ago, after a donation of parts and tools, they only repaired clients' bikes. But that changed once donated bikes started showing up. So far this uh, summer, I've given away 25 bikes, and I probably have another 10, 15 that I'm just working my way through, and working through the list of names of the guests who are looking for bikes. Um, Last year, I think we distributed about 40 bikes. David Manville refurbishes and distributes the restored donated bikes during the week. And then on Friday mornings, the courtyard is open for repairs. Now he needs help. He's looking for volunteers who have mechanical skills. Manville says he isn't surprised by the demand because the bikes offer clients freedom and independence. That could look a number of different ways. It could, it could be coming here to get a meal or to, to access some of the other services. It could be getting to a doctor's appointment. It could be getting to a job interview or an apartment viewing. Um, you know, there's countless reasons why having transportation is, is going to benefit somebody's life. If you're in a generous mood and feel like donating, they'll take your bicycle parts and old bicycles too. But what they really need right now are these things. Bicycle locks. Cease Hair, CBC News, St. John's. Welcome to Mount Pearl, Mount Pearl. I'm hanging out at the Admiralty House Communications Museum in the beautiful city of Mount Pearl. We're gonna learn about what's been happening here all summer and tonight there's a special tour. And we're gonna tell you all about that coming up on Here and Now.
Welcome back, everyone. And Ashley, uh, I'd say today was someday on plants. <laughs> <laughs> Rather than someday on clothes, someday on plants, because of the rain, I'm sure all of the plants out there, all the flowers, just uh, drank it in. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. we did uh, see some showers, so depending on where you were. Uh, but the other thing that was notable was, I guess, the cooler temperatures. Mm -hmm. But it certainly didn't feel cooler because it was humid. So we'll take a look at uh, what we saw as our daytime highs today. 21 degrees in St. John's and uh, still in the mid to high 20s for Central, heading towards the coast again. Uh, 25 degrees in Cornerbrook today. Day. And then for the north, the uh, rather the Labrador coast, it was only sitting in the single digits. Now I did just mention that Humidex. So even though we only reached a high near 28 degrees in St. John's or 21, it felt like 28 with that humidity. So you can certainly feel that along with that rain. 31, it felt like in Gander and Deer Lake at 27. Now this humidity is going to stick around. Uh, not quite as much as what we're seeing for today, but uh, still going to feel a little bit sticky tomorrow. Here's a look at the current temperatures. Only dropped uh, a couple degrees here and there. Uh, 21 degrees it is right now in Happy Valley Goose Bay and St. Anthony sitting at 20. So. We did see those showers move through. You can see that uh, for Central as well. Seeing some lightning uh, right now, and that's, that risk will continue at least, I'd say, for the next hour or so for some areas as we see these showers uh, spark up. But the general trend is clearing as we head through the overnight. We will start to see uh, eventually by the time midnight rolls around for eastern Newfoundland and the uh, Avalon. Otherwise, going to stay unsettled up through Labrador through the night, some coastal RDF as well, and then uh, you're going to stay cloudy through morning. So here's a look at the temperatures, not really uh, dipping down to too much, still sitting in the mid teens overnight tonight. Some southwesterlies for the west coast, 10 to 15 kilometers per hour, but again, general clearing trend, still hanging on to that risk of showers for the next couple of hours for the Avalon, and then eventually things will clear out. Some west southwesterlies, 20 to 30 kilometers per hour, and then up through Labrador, another chilly night for the coast, again, some RDF. Uh, 8 degrees for Cartwright, 11 for Happy Valley Goose Bay, same for Lab City with those winds generally out of the west southwest, 10 to 15 kilometers per hour. So tomorrow looks like a lovely day, just a few cloudy periods expected for the island. Otherwise, uh, staying generally cloudy, some morning showers for the southeastern portion of Labrador. Otherwise, some showers will move in for Lab West could even uh, see the risk, slight risk. We could see a few uh, lightning strikes. Otherwise, staying generally cloudy for the big land. Some more showers will move in, but that'll be towards the morning, early morning hours for central. So here's your temperatures going to recover quite nicely from today. So back to the mid to high teens again, not quite as humid as today, but still going to feel that humidity in the air. 26 degrees for Clarenville, 24 for Marystown and then uh, Grand Falls winds are 27 degrees. Twillingate should reach a high near 20 tomorrow. Harbor Breton. 22 and then uh, heading towards the west coast again similar temperatures 26 it looks like for corner brook and then heading towards the northern peninsula slight chance we could see a few showers in the first half of the day and then it should clear out 17 degrees for st anthony and then hanging on to that chance again in the morning hours for southeastern labrador 10 degrees though looks like the afternoon high for cartwright and then lab city sitting at 17 tomorrow and it's still hanging on to that chance of RDF for uh, essentially McCovic northward to Nain with those onshore winds. And eventually that's going to change as we head towards the weekend. But there is a cool down before that happens. I'll have all those details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, it's been a busy summer at the Admiralty House Communications Museum in Mount Pearl. And that's where we find here now is Jeremy Eaton. So, Jeremy, what's been happening there this summer? Well, we're standing in uh, their, one of their big exhibits. This is actually the Annex, which is right next door to the Admiralty House Communication Museum in Mount Pearl. And this is the Field to Flight exhibit, honoring the 100th anniversary of the first transatlantic flight. But as many people who watch the show know, I don't know much about anything, but Samantha Galton is the assistant manager here, and she knows a lot more. Samantha, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for coming. Not a problem. So this, how long has this museum been up and running, and uh, how long do people have left to see it? Yep, so Field to Flight actually opened on May 13th, and it's open until August 31st, seven days a week from 9 o'clock until 5 o'clock. And what's the turnout? I know that it was a big deal. There was a big event here earlier this summer. What's the turnout been like here uh, in Mount Pearl for this uh, exhibit? It's been amazing. We've had a lot of really great programs all summer long. Uh, lots of summer camps and different school-age kids that have been coming through. So it's been really great. 
Now, you were telling me before we did this interview that you played a role in this. Can you talk about what you were, you were hands-on in this uh, exhibit? So what, what did you do for it? Yeah, so I was the marketing and design coordinator here at uh, Admiralty House. So I helped with the, the creating of the exhibit along with a couple other people. Um, so yeah. So there's a lot to see here. We're only showing you a fraction of it, but we're doing this for a purpose. What's your favorite part? Oh my goodness, there's so many amazing parts, but one of them would have to be the scrapbook by Margaret Carter, which we have on display. Uh, it's just here. It's from Archives and Special Collections, Memorial Libraries, and of course the Carter family. Now people here now, audience, may remember that Zach Gowdy did a story on this earlier this year and we interviewed, uh, I do believe it was the nephew of Margaret Carter, Peter Carter, but that sort of scrapbook inspired you to have another event here. Can you talk about the Pilot's Picnic that happens here? Yeah, for sure. So Pilot's Picnic is every Wednesday and Sunday from 12 o'clock to 2 o'clock. Uh, it's a partnership with the City of Mount Pearl, the museum, and of course, Coffee Matters. Uh, you arrive, you'll get a uh, blanket so that you can go out on our beautiful grounds, and you'll get a sandwich and, you know, a uh, drink of lemonade and different things, and you'll actually have a picnic on the grounds wrapped the same style that Margaret Carter would have wrapped the lunch for Alcock and Brown. So is, this so, oh, so is this sort of the inspiration here, and can you talk a little bit about this piece of the exhibit? For sure, it definitely is. So this is a silk cloth that we have on display. Uh, it was used to wrap a sandwich for Alcock and Brown, the day of their big flight, of course. Um, and of course, you can see here that they actually autographed it and signed Ooh. it and dated it uh, before they sent it back. Well, it's very neat. Well, we appreciate your time. Thanks so much for, yeah. now they opened up this exhibit just for us. So thank you, Samantha, for doing that. Uh, but we have another, another special event is happening out here on the grounds of the Admiralty House Communication Museum in Mount Pearl. And we're going to tell you about that later on the show. Reporting live for here now, I'm Jeremy Eaton in Mount Pearl. It's felt I'm a mix. And I've been to Canada seven times, you know, I spent a lot of time in Canada. My whole family is Canadian. I always expected Canada would help me, and they didn't, you know. He's known as Jihadi Jack. He's half British, half Canadian, but now the UK has pulled his citizenship. Will Canada help him come here?
welcome back. Well, as you heard earlier in the show, opposition leader Chess Crosby is calling for the Auditor General to investigate the circumstances around government's failure to cap the wetlands prior to the Muskrat Falls flooding. Government had $30 million set aside to do that work, which could prevent methylmercury contamination of food sources in the area. Premier Ball says the capping didn't happen because of an oversight, and Crosby wants that investigated. Well, there, uh, Michael, has been a rupture in relations with indigenous communities as a result of the government's failure to adhere to the agreement they made with them to do the wetland capping. This is a serious matter which has engaged the attention of the commissioner of the Muskrat Falls inquiry. It's something he wants to make findings on and come to grips with, yet he finds the absence of evidence, and there is a gap in evidence, confounding. That's the expression he used to counsel in the final submission. So, uh, unfortunately, we're going to labor under the mystery of what happened to uh, cause this, uh, this failure in relations with the indigenous people because it was a solemn undertaking unless we use some other mechanism to get to the bottom of what went wrong. Was there, was there bad faith involved in this or was it simply incompetence? We will never know the answer to this unless we use a mechanism like the Auditor General to get the facts of the matter, to start the process of healing with indigenous people and to fill in the gap that the commissioner has in the evidence and that gap is Minister Parsons. What we have here is a situation whereby Mr. Parsons has been dodging the press all summer. He's now taken the position that as former minister he can't speak about his activities in the portfolio. He's pointed us to Ms. Dempster, the present minister. She takes the position she can't comment on the activities of former ministers and she's not going to investigate either. And the lawyers for Mr. Ball have told the inquiry that it's not his job to investigate. So unless this happens, we won't know. Now, two of the indigenous groups accepted the offer of $10 million each in lieu of this capping. Uh, one of the other groups did not. What, what do you make of that? And how would this investigation uh, potentially change that deal? Well, uh, first of all, I think that New Natsivut in their statement in writing described it as hush money. I'm quoting them now. And, you know, most people would say that it certainly does seem to have that appearance, although, uh, you know, one of the groups was quite vociferous and denied that it was going to have that effect on them when they made their submission to the commissioner. So uh, hush money, people can make their own minds up about that. Two of them have accepted the money. There's no taking that back, and I'm sure they'll find a good use for it. Do you have any conversations with the leadership of the Inu Nation, the Inutuva Community Council, or the Nazi government before presenting this today? I have not directly communicated with those groups. Um, I've followed the whole issue very closely, and I've been quite perturbed at these turns of events. How they can fail to execute on a solemn undertaking made by the Premier, which he says everybody knew he wanted executed, how that can happen and be described as a miscommunication coming from the Department of Environment to, to Cabinet is, is indeed confounding, as the, men, as the uh, Commissioner of the Inquiry has said. The problem he has that is that not having heard from the responsible minister, he's got a gap in his evidence. Uh, he'll still be obliged to make whatever findings he can make based on the evidence he has. Uh, but he may take some consolation from the fact that there will be, I hope, further investigation to get at the facts. Well, turning now to national news, a 24-year-old man accused of joining the Islamic State is asking Canada to take him in. Jack Letts, known as Jihadi Jack, was a dual British-Canadian citizen until this week when London stripped him of his British citizenship. Now imprisoned in Syria, Letts made an appeal on British television. I've always felt I'm a mix. And I've been to Canada seven times, and you know, I spent a lot of time in Canada. My whole family is Canadian. And I have no relatives in Britain anyway. Everyone's in Canada. And you know, I, I always expected Canada would help me, and they didn't. You know. I hope Canada does take me from here if they can. They take me to Canada, that will be good. 
Now his father, John Letts, insists his son was never involved in violence perpetrated by ISIS and only went to Syria to help establish a peaceful Muslim state. John Letts and his wife, Sally Lane, were convicted of funding terrorism after they sent their son the equivalent of $360 in 2015. Jack Letts was captured by Kurdish forces five years ago. Now, Britain's decision to revoke the citizenship of the man known as Jihadi Jack is raising questions here in Canada, namely what the federal government's next step should be. And joining me now with more on this impact of this story on this side of the Atlantic is senior parliamentary reporter Julie Van Dusen. So, Julie, how is this playing out here in Canada? Well, the Canadian government is angry at Britain's move. They effectively dumped the whole Jack Letts case on to Canada. It's a political hot potato, and there's not much Canada can do. After all, he's a dual citizen, and uh, his father is Canadian, so they now have to deal with it. Uh, the Prime Minister says that it's a crime to travel internationally with a goal of supporting terrorism or engaging in terrorism, and uh, people who do this will be prosecuted. But, Carolyn, he did leave from Britain. He didn't leave from Canada. And some people say this makes the case quite complicated. Now, we're in a political uh, field right now, heading into an election. So this is all very political. And certainly Andrew Scheer, the leader of the Conservatives, says, if I become prime minister, I won't lift a finger for this guy. So take a listen. Trudeau's position on this is very well known. He has uh, indicated that returning ISIS fighters can be rehabilitated and should take poetry lessons. Uh, we believe they should be held accountable for their horrific crimes. All right, so he's not mincing words there for sure. Mm -hmm. So, Julie, what happens next? Well, again, as I say, it's complicated. He talked about horrific crimes. We still are not clear exactly what Jack Letts did there. So the NDP, Amnesty International, say uh, he is Canadian. Bring him here. Put him through the Canadian justice system. Letts himself says it was the stupidest thing that he ever did going over there in the first place. And now uh, he wants to help uh, people, you know, turn against ISIS. He, want, he wants to help in de-radicalization. And, of course, the parents are pleading to give their son a second chance, but he's not getting a welcome mat here from the Canadian government. Take a listen to Ralph Goodale. The point is that uh, that uh, he is currently in, in custody in, uh, uh, in a Kurdish facility, uh, and uh, Canada is not obliged uh, legally to uh, facilitate uh, his, his travel, and we won't. So it's not clear if he's just going to rot there in that jail. Some are saying the prime minister should bring this case up when uh, the G7 meets in France. That's coming up, and he should talk to Boris Johnson about it. But so far, that's not on the agenda. All right. Thanks so much, Julie. You're welcome. That's senior parliamentary reporter Julie Van Dusen live in Ottawa. Well, keeping with national news, the Canadian Armed Forces is determining whether a soldier suspected of recruiting for a hate group will keep his job. The military is investigating Master Corporal Patrick Matthews, an Army reservist in Manitoba, and his possible ties to the neo-Nazi group. The Army's new commander says it does not tolerate racist behavior. We have absolutely no time uh, for those that do not hold the values of, of the Army and the Canadian Armed Forces and the values of Canada. Experts on terrorism describe the group called The Base as a death cult that is planning for a race war. Posters seeking recruits for the group have appeared around Winnipeg in recent weeks. Matthews' alleged activities were revealed by the Winnipeg Free Press after one of its reporters went undercover, posing as a recruit. Well, the pre-election campaign promise from Conservative Party leader Andrew Scheer to make maternal and paternal leave benefits free of federal taxes, but the pledge is not quite as advertised. New Conservative government will provide a non-refundable tax credit of 15% for any income earned under the EI maternity and parental benefit programs. Well, that means new parents would still have to pay the tax up front on EI benefits received, but could apply the proposed credit at tax time. It would not be available to low income or modest income earners who pay no tax on the benefit anyway. And it would also not apply to the more than one third of all new parents who didn't qualify for EI benefits in the first place. The liberal policy on parental leave has been to increase the amount of time new parents can take off to bond with their infants.
It's almost like a treasure hunt. It, it's really fun to do. A fun family tradition in the Goulds finds its way to the Swiss Alps. That story ahead on Here and Now. Welcome back to Here and Now. A rock painted by a little girl from this province has found its way to the Swiss Alps. What started as some family fun has now connected two families from different parts of the world. Here and Now's Arianna Kellant has that story. This is a regular activity at Tanya Swatsky's house. Where'd you put that? Find rocks, paint them, hide them, repeat. We've seen, um, cool rocks painted on trails like Signal Hill Trail, Cape Spear, and when we see them on the trails, it's almost like a treasure hunt. It, it's really fun to do, so we started painting them to hide them, to give somebody else a treasure hunt feeling kind of thing. In July, oldest sibling Kate painted a ladybug with a note attached, asking that whoever finds it brings it along with them on their travels. Then, younger sister Claire hid it in the departures area of St. John's International Airport. We thought maybe security swooped it up or something, but maybe a month or more went by and we seen a post on that Facebook page, NL Rock Art, and uh, we were floored when it was found like 1,900 meters up in the Swiss Alps. On August 13th, more than 1,600 kilometers away in Switzerland, Vanessa Rodolfi spotted a red rock under a bench near her chalet. Exciting. Very exciting. Did you ever believe that it would get that far? No. Since then, the two mothers have connected through the Facebook page NL Rock Art, a group that has amassed over 29,000 members. Their message is simple. Paint a rock, hide a rock. Rodolfi, who's right. from France, and Swatsky yeah, in the fun. Ghouls have been trying to find the missing link between the Swiss Alps and St. John's. In the meantime, the rock will soon make its way to Morocco as per Kate's instructions. And for this family, well, they'll keep on painting rocks, but hiding them a little closer to home. Ariana Kelland, CBC News, St. John's.
Oh, what a nice story. Well, this province has a deep connection to fairy folklore, and tonight in Mount Pearl, there is a special fairy door tour taking place, and here now is Jeremy Eaton is on hand to learn more. So, Jeremy, how does this tour work? So right now we're looking at a stump house and there's a number of these similar things like this posted all around uh, the grounds just at the Admiralty House Communications Museum here in Mount Pearl. But this was all the idea of Tina. Tina, thanks for joining us. Thank you. So where does the idea come from? How do you sit around being like, you know what I want to do? I want to do a fairy door tour. How did you come up with that idea? That's a good question, and I'm not even sorry, sure I can answer it. Um, I get asked that a lot. I spend a lot of time in nature and have for a good number of years doing a lot of hiking on the East Coast Trail. And um, was always curious, where are all the children? Where are the families? We're even adults. I see so few people out there. So it kind of started off as a, an idea for a project, really, of um, planting some magic along the trail, hoping it, you know word would spread and people would be out there searching for these beautiful little homes. But um, it didn't work out as I thought. There was a lot of vandalism. And um, so the idea died. It petered out. I forgot about it. But it kept tugging at me, nagging at me. And, um, you know, I feel like it was a, an idea gifted by the fairies themselves, to be honest. The nature fairies, of course, you know. So how would a typical, so what, would, what are the kids and the adults who come here tonight at 7 o'clock? Uh, what's going to, what are they going to do? How is this going to work for them? Well, we start off, we read a little tiny fairy oath with a magnifying glass and a little tiny leather bound journal. And once they take the oath, um, then they get a little treasure bag, which is for leaving little gifts for the fairies. So if they see a home they like, they want to leave a little thank you, that's what they do. They'll leave a gem or a seashell or something special. Um, we make letters for a fairy mailbox and we visit a fairy mailbox on our walk and deliver mail to them. Sometimes there's even mail waiting for us. If there's a birthday child, there might be a little teeny tiny birthday card there for them. Um, and, you know, we use clues to find a variety of homes, fairy, elf and gnomes. It's not just fairies. It's not just for girls. Um, even adults love it. So, yeah, we use these clues. We head through. It's kind of like a scavenger hunt. But we'll have little activities as well. We might um, fill a grumpy gnome's wed woodshed, you know, full of wood or, you know, something of that sort. Now, I'm just going to step away from this because, Danny, can we get a shot of this? I'm going to ruin the shot because I'm going to walk right in front of it. But you may remember Samantha. So not only is she the assistant manager here, she's also Tina's daughter. Thanks, thanks for coming back. <laughs> no thanks problem. for changing your shirt. <laughs> so now walk us through what the kids would do if, uh, if you know, if the tour was on. What, what would happen down here? Yeah, so this is actually a beautiful little stump home. And of course, like the special activities, this one actually has make a wish. So on this little plaque, it says make a wish and do not tell. Then drop a gift into the well. The fairies watch from above. So be sure to wish with love. All right, so I'm going to reach into my fairy bag here and uh, come up with a little, could, I can't reach, can I throw, make a wish? I'm, I'm going to make the wish, but you throw it in. So, Ashley, I, I'm wishing for better weather. <laughs> Anyways, all right, appreciate your time. Thanks for showing us that. Now, I just wanted to come up. If somebody wanted to, where, I know that you're doing it at house. This is one night only at the Admiralty House, but where do you normally do these tours? We're at Pippi Park every Saturday at 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. We do recommend people book in advance because typically by Thursday it's sold out for the weekend, and if not, maybe by Friday night. Um, if it rains on a Saturday, we push it ahead to the same time on Sunday. If you can't make it, you can reschedule or get a full refund. We do birthday parties as well and group tours, so we always have uh, kindergarten students and youth groups coming out. Yeah. That's perfect. Well, thank you so much for taking thank the time. I appreciate it. I hope you get a good crowd tonight. The rain has held We're off. Sold which out already. Sold out we already. <laughs> so we got the sneak peek. Thank you very much for that. We appreciate your time, Tina, and for your daughter coming out. <laughs> so, Caroline, I wished for better weather. Mm -hmm. I hope Ashley's going to come through, because if not, I'm going to be rotted. <laughs> well, she just told me just then that your wish will indeed come true, that tomorrow is going to be better than today. So there you go. <laughs> Well, thank you, and uh, we're gonna. That's that's enough for. I'm gonna let the, uh, Tina get ready for the tour. That's gonna start any minute, and we're gonna throw it back to you in the studio, which is probably a little bit less fun because you don't have a precious fairy bag. No fairies <laughs> here. <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> We've been far too slow in waking up to the issues and acting on the damaging impact our ways of living are having on the world. But some are taking issue with how the Duke and Duchess are living. Turbulent times for the royal eco-warriors. More on that story just ahead.
Welcome back, everyone. So as we mentioned just before the break, Ashley, uh, you're saying that tomorrow is going to be a much nicer day. So Jeremy gets his uh, fairy wish. Yeah, except that he said it out loud. So hopefully it doesn't <gasps> jinx it. <laughs> That's a really good point. That's OK. It's Didn't even right. think of that. He's supposed to keep it secret. He's supposed to keep it a secret. Didn't you learn that from making wishes on birthday totally. cakes? I don't know. But you're, you're still going to pull through. Yeah, no. Him, so it's, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> yeah, hopefully the forecast doesn't change, but uh, we'll take a quick look at it uh, one more time. It does look like temperatures should be in the mid to high 20s tomorrow. A little breezy, though. Westerly winds 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. The West Coast looks like they should be generally light winds. But again, looks like sunshine, just a few cloudy periods and then up through a Labrador. Some rain will move in, could even see the potential for a few thunderstorms for Lab City. Very slight risk, but it's still there. Uh, and then Happy Valley Goose Bay should see sunshine only uh, sitting around 16 degrees. So a little bit of a drop in that temperature. And then along the uh, coastal portions of uh, the big land, you're looking at temperatures about eight, nine degrees, a little warmer down through Mary's Harbor at 16 degrees. Now, once uh, we start to see the sunshine move in, we're going to see some cloud cover move in right behind it. And that's going to be our next weather maker as we head through the day on Thursday. Most of that shower activity will move back in for Lab West. And then eventually we're going to start to see those showers make their way towards the West Coast, slowly spreading through the day uh, by the time it reaches the Avalon, likely in the late evening or overnight hours, we'll start to see that shower activity. And it could be heavy at times as well by the time uh, the overnight rolls around. So here's a look at the temperatures. A little cooler for uh, the Avalon. 19 degrees should be the afternoon high, but still holding on to those mid 20s for Central. Uh, Port of Basque, 20 degrees. And then a little cooler as we start to get into some of that colder air, as I was mentioning a little bit earlier as well. 11 degrees for St. Anthony, uh, staying in that uh, 10 degree range for Cartwright. Happy Valley Goose Bay, 12 degrees, and Lab City sitting at 15. Now, uh, over the next couple of days, again, you're going to see that heat first, but then temperatures will start to dip. So here's a look at uh, what's expected for Friday. More rain for uh, the day, 22 degrees, and then we're going to start to see that drop in temperatures by uh, Saturday and Sunday morning as well. These temperatures uh, overnight sitting in those single digits and then highs in the teens. Slight chance we could see a few showers on Saturday, but that's uh, if it does develop at all. And then Sunday looks like the better day for sure with uh, plenty of sunshine as we speak. Now for central Newfoundland, hitting the 20s, mid 20s right through Friday with that chance of showers. Saturday is when we'll see that drop in temperatures. Look at your overnight low Saturday night, five degrees. Uh, and then same for uh, Sunday night as well, only sitting around eight degrees. But that temperature does recover, should sit around 20 degrees. Same thing for Western Newfoundland with that dip in temperatures with uh, recovering on Sunday. And then for Eastern Labrador, 12 degrees for both Thursday and Friday. Then that ridge of high pressure will move in, bringing that warmer air right along with it. And then same thing for Western Labrador, 17 degrees tomorrow, 11 by Friday, and then back up to the 20 degree mark for your Sunday. So that's a look at your forecast. I have a weather photo when I come back, Carolyn. Thanks, Ashley. Well, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex have spoken extensively about climate change, but now their words are coming back to haunt them. Meghan and Harry are under fire for their use of private jets for flights in 11 days, including a personal trip to Elton John's private home. Renee Filipponi has the latest on the controversy. Everything the Duke and Duchess of Sussex do is highly scrutinized by the press here, and this is no exception. The couple, along with their son Archie, have taken a number of vacations this summer using private jets, the latest on Elton John's plane to his home in Nice. Now, the controversy lies in the fact that the pair have been pushing for action on climate change and environmental issues, and yet they appear to have no problems with the carbon footprint of flying in these exclusive jets. Have a look at some of the headlines today, clever as they usually are here. One reads, fourth private jet trip in 11 days is car bonkers. Another calling this turbulent times for the prince. Recently, Harry spoke about the decision to only have two children because of concerns of overpopulation and the impact on the environment. It's a consistent message for the pair. Let's talk about the health of our planet too. Climate change is a humanitarian issue, not a political one.
And it's one where we've been far too slow in waking up to the issues and acting on the damaging impact our ways of living are having on the world. Now, Elton John was a close friend of Princess Diana and came to the couple's defense, saying it's been a stressful time for the pair who've had to deal with distorted and malicious accounts of their trip to his home. And he also wrote this very personal response, saying, Prince Harry's mother, Diana, Princess of Wales, was one of my dearest friends. I feel a profound sense of obligation to protect Harry and his family from the unnecessary press intrusions that contributed to Diana's untimely death. Elton John also pointed out that he paid for carbon offsets for the flight. So far, Buckingham Palace has not commented on this. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. I want to know where you're to. This photo was sent to us by Evelyn Johnson somewhere along the coast. <laughs> I'll tell you where this photo is too when we come back. Welcome back, everyone. Yeah, now here's something you don't see every day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> those are mattresses, uh, dozens of them tumbling through a neighborhood in Denver, Colorado over the weekend. They look like tumbleweeds. They've been uh, set up for an outdoor movie night when the wind picked up and uh, then picked them up. So those are clearly air mattresses. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, I'm like, what is the point of this? I thought they were racing them at one point. That was weird. <laughs> that is something you definitely don't see every day. No, definitely not. And this site that you're about to show us, this beautiful photo, what yeah. a gorgeous shot that And it's is. something I would love to see every day, that's yeah. for sure. This photo was taken on the Skirwink Trail. <sighs> so somewhere between Port Rexton, Trinity area, uh, beautiful shot there. I definitely, I haven't hiked that yet. That's no, my plan. Neither. 
that's certainly my plan. Uh, maybe my, it's still summer's not over yet. It's not over yet. And you know what? September is gorgeous. That's right. Um, I'd like to, to head out there like maybe in September and go for a nice hike. I see. Yeah, because then the colors, everything, leaves start changing. Oh, that drive's probably beautiful as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, thank you to Evelyn Johnson for sending that photo in. And if you have, she actually sent that to my Facebook page, but if you have any photos you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca or my Facebook page at uh, Ashley CBC and uh, try and get them on the show. I love seeing the pictures of flowers right now too, because yes. we're getting into this other whole other bloom that's happening right now with like the hydrangeas are starting to come out and the hostas have their flowers. So there yeah. are lots of opportunities out there to take some pretty photos. Absolutely, and sunset photos. Did you see the sunset last night? No, I didn't, oh. but I saw pictures of it. It was beautiful. I'm surprised yeah. I didn't get more photos of the sunset. The yeah. colors were insane. I've never seen a sky that purple mm. before. Yeah. It was beautiful. Yeah, it did look really nice. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Well, that's it for us. Good night, everyone. Good night.